Good evening. Good evening and welcome to Sunday Night with Faith Family Church of God. I'm so glad you're joining. Let's have a quick word of prayer before we go into Acts 5 tonight. Pray with me, Father. In Jesus' name, I thank you for this time that we have together, Lord, to be in your word and be in your presence. And that is my prayer, God, that your spirit would truly reach and touch people through this broadcast. And God, that they would feel your presence, your anointing, God, that they would feel, Lord, your spirit moving them into your word. God, I pray that you would give me the words I need to speak. And Lord, let it all be for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you. We praise you for all of these things. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, welcome and thank you for joining tonight. We're going to be finishing Acts 5 tonight. Brother Andrew, if you remember last Sunday night, he did Acts 5 um, and he was talking about uh, Acts 5, 1 through 11 to be specific. And he was talking about um, the famous passage of scripture that relates to Ananias and Sapphira and how you'll remember he brought out how they had conspired to sell some of their property and donate the funds to the church that at the time was a growing church um, that Jesus had established, like others had done as God moved on them to do so. But the problem was that God did not move. Scripture does not tell us that God did not, uh, that God moved on in an essence of fire to sell their property. He never moved on the, on their hearts to do that, that we read, but they made up this plan and they lied before the Lord by saying they were giving all instead of giving uh, and, and instead of giving all, they kept back part of the proceeds. Now, the, he brought out how they were tempted, first of all, tempted with that greed and tempted with the desire to be recognized and applauded by men. You know, they they were seeing other people do this in earnest. God had moved on some to sell their property, and they had done that, and they had given all the proceeds to help the church. So they kind of wanted that um, that that was that temptation to be admired and to be looked at by the other people, you know, as being a part of that movement. And then, um, you know, in doing so, they wound up lying before God, keeping some for themselves, and they both fell dead because of their dishonesty before God. And so, uh, you know, Andrew also, Brother Andrew also reminded us that uh, how we need to be responsible for our own souls. Each of them had the opportunity, Ananias and Sapphira, even though they were husband and wife, they both had the opportunity to come before God and before the man of God and tell the truth. And both of them lied before God. Um, and so each of them were responsible for their actions. And he was reminding us last week about how we must also be responsible for our actions. We cannot blame parents, grandparents, or anybody else for that matter, for whether or not we are healthy spiritually, doing the right thing, following God, or whether we're not. So tonight, we're going to pick up where he left off, and we're going to finish up Acts 5. Now, there's a few verses here, and I'm going to read uh, in like three chunks and then tell you what I feel like the Lord uh, was showing me as I studied the Word. So we're going to start in Acts 5, 12 through 42, and I'm going to use the New King James Version. So let's start there. The Bible says, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch, yet none of them... None of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Now, once again, in this little section of the word, we see a common theme. You know, the last several weeks that we've been studying Acts, we notice that every time a great move of God seems to be happening, it mentions the same thing, that they're all in one accord together. This time they were in one accord at Solomon's temple, um, at, at Solomon's porch, the temple at Solomon's porch, uh, believing and teaching and preaching and the things that Jesus had shown them and told them. So they believed his word. They were in one accord. That means that they were together in faith. They were praying for the people that had physical and spiritual needs. And they were seeing not only healings take place, but people who were tormented by demon spirits, people who were tormented uh, by the devil himself, you know, sending those spirits out on them, were being released, restored, renewed. So there were a lot of miracle signs and wonders here. Now, if I was going to title 
everything I was going to talk about tonight, I was going to call this unstoppable God. And you'll notice my background is this flowing type of river scene. It's beautiful. I love it. But it represents what the Bible says in certain places about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moves. The Holy Spirit, it flows. He flows out of our belly, shall flow rivers of living water. That's what scripture says. And here we see it happening. They are in one accord. They are believing God. They are teaching and preaching the word of God. And they're seeing miracles happen. They're praying in faith over these things. Scripture here relates that God did the miracles through the hands of the apostles. You notice how it said that in the very beginning. It was through their hands. It was not the apostles themselves. You know, nowadays we got to be careful that we don't have preacher religion. There are a lot of times when people, uh, a preacher moves and they they can't, they, they have a hard time adapting, um, and then they, they want to have that preacher religion. Well, this was my favorite preacher growing up, and I have the utmost uh, respect for them, and I think they're the true deal, and they may be. I'm not saying they're not. I'm not saying they're not men and women of God, but I'm saying that we got to be careful that we are not believing what's happening through a minister just because we knew them, loved them, and were a part of them for so long of a time. I know that in my time, I've seen that more days, more often now. That was kind of more of the thing in the 70s and 80s and early 90s. But now I'm telling you, a lot of people have preacher religion because they see them on social media. They see them on television. And what they see, the image that they're perceiving, they like. So then they follow that preacher. And sometimes they're not always considering the source of their power. You know, we have to realize that uh, it is not through our own abilities. It's not through our own power that any miracle signs or, and wonders come about at all. It wasn't the apostles that were doing these mir these miracles on those particular days. It was not them. It was not because it was Peter and James or John or whoever. It was because they were filled with the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost, God's Spirit, was moving through them and giving them the anointing and the power to do what they needed to do. Now, we can appreciate people for being willing to allow the Lord to use them, and I think that's important. We all need to uh, love one another, appreciate what we, each one does for the kingdom of God. But we have to always remember that it is through the power of God only, only through him. God is the only one that can heal. And Jesus is the only one that can save. And only God really delivers people and sets them free from bondage. It's not because I say so out of my own strength. But if I'm speaking it through the authority and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, well, then we know it is his strength, it is his power, and it is his spirit that delivers. God can use people, and he will use people, and he does use people, but the power is his alone, amen? And so we always want to keep that in mind. Now, verse 14 tells us that the church was continuing to grow, and we're adding believers. But then if you, did you notice in verse 13, it said the rest dared to, uh, dared to join them, the apostles, in other words? This almost sounds conflicting because it sounds like in verse 13, people were hesitating. They didn't really want to go into the, the temple or Solomon's porch where the apostles were, but they would lay people, some of them were laying them outside on the way to the temple because they were just hoping that Paul's shadow would fall on them, the Bible says, um, and then they would be healed. Now, why were they afraid? Why do we have in verse 13, why does it tell us that they were hesitant to join them? Well, verse 13, first of all, we need to understand verses 13 and 14 are talking about two different groups of people. Verse 13 is talking about the people who were sort of the outsiders of the church or the non-believing society and community around them. They had heard and seen, remember what happened just before this. Ananias and Sapphira had just uh, been, had just died. Uh, they were, they were thought to be of part of the church. They were thought to be part of those believers and they fell dead suddenly and unexpectedly. And so the other people, uh, all of a sudden, you know, they, they had a lot of, a lot of, uh, reverence, which is respect. And they had a lot of concern about being very close to some of these apostles and some of these believers. What they didn't know is that Ananias and Sapphira had loved, again, had loved the idea of being recognized and praised for their works more than they loved praising the Lord and giving everything to him. You know, they were trying to uh, to take that 
into themselves, that money that they were saying they were given, um, the attention, they wanted all of that. They didn't understand that Ananias and Sapphira had lied before the Lord. The Bible said they lied to the Holy Spirit and they embraced greed and recognition more than they embraced God and his grace. So for the unbelievers in their in their society, in their town um, that were there, um, all they saw was we have two people who seem to have uh, nice things, seem to have a, a little and uh, maybe a you know middle class. I don't know. Maybe they were wealthy class. They had extra property. Um, and all of a sudden they were trying to donate to the church and they died. So they really didn't understand that. They didn't understand that they were doing this kind of under false pretense and under uh, the cloak of lies. So for the unbeliever, they were afraid. They were hesitant to be a part of that church that was up and growing and new, and they were afraid to be around some of those apostles and believers because they didn't want the same thing to happen to them uh, as happened to Ananias and Sapphira. But can I just tell you what they were witnessing was the realness of God. All of a sudden, you know, things got real, as we say, and they saw that God is real. And there are times in our lives, you know, when God gives us uh, those kinds of, of wake-up calls. We see him as real. We experience him as being even more real than we had before. And, you know, for some people who are not sold out, if you're not sold out to the Lord, something like that, or if you're, you call yourself a non-believer, something like that causes a lot of fear, but it also causes reverence. They understand that it's real. It's happening. It, it really did happen. There really is a power that affected Ananias and Sapphira to the point of death. And so they were hesitant to join the church, but then there were others who were drawn to it because they were believers and because they were seeking, they were looking for more. When the church is in one accord and people are obeying the spirit of God and they're praying in faith and allowing the flow of the Holy Spirit, the flow, think about this river behind me here, they were allowing the flow of the Holy Spirit to move through them, then God is able to show himself through miracles, signs, and wonders, and that encourages his children in the church, but it also helps to reach the unbelievers. More than once in the Bible, we see this is true. Remember what Jesus often did? What was his pattern when he was on earth? Well, he preached and he taught people about God and about who he was and about the scriptures, but then he performed miracles, and it was out of his love for the people he did that, yes, but it was also so they would believe his words so that he would, they would believe that he was the Son of God and what he was saying was true. So often he did these miracles, but it was to reach uh, not only his children and to bless them, but it was to reach that unbeliever. Brother Little and I were talking the other day and just totally amazed at what God did this past Sunday morning during our, our service in the prayer line that we had. He felt led of the Lord to do the prayer line. And, and I guess everybody or most everybody received prayer in the church that day. But we were sitting there thinking about um, what had happened since then. And there's no doubt about it. The movement of God last Sunday was truly the spirit and the power of the Holy Ghost moving among us. And his spirit was demonstrated in our midst. And there were at least, we were trying to count it and try to um, you know, figure out just how many people and things were affected since the prayers that went up that day. And I know at least five or to seven, somewhere in there, if I'm counting a, um, you know, a few things that maybe uh, the church did not recognize as a need, but five or seven uh, miracles and answers to prayers came about because of that service that Sunday morning, last Sunday morning. And that we know of. Now, I'm not, I'm counting what I know. I don't know. There are some things, sometimes people don't um, always tell. Sometimes people keep things within themselves. It's private. So we don't always know. But I know that five, six, seven uh, miracles, transformations have happened since last Sunday morning's blessing in the church. And I believe God did these things to encourage the church and encourage people, but also to help unbelievers who are watching us and who are uh, related to us and connected to us and to help the weak in faith to see that God's power is real. It's true. It's real. It happens. He's still God. He's still in control. He has all power. When God performs miracles and answers prayers for us, we need to be sure we tell people. We need to be sure that we share that word on social media because people need to be reminded that God's power is real and that he still moves today. 
Um, we, we want everybody to know, just like these apostles were doing. They were preaching Jesus and his great power in Solomon's temple. They were telling people who he was and, and, and who he is and, and his great power and his love and his grace. And people need to see the realness of God in us as his children. If we're claiming to be his children, they got to see our faith in action, the realness of God in us. Now, verse 17 and 18 says, then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. Now, what is indignation? Because it said they were filled with that. You know, hopefully we'd want to read they were filled with the Holy Spirit, but it didn't say that here. It said they were filled with indignation. What is indignation? Well, some definitions of indignation are anger, annoyance, and jealousy. Now, I want you to think about that. Let that soak in a minute. These were religious leaders of the day, and they were seeing people being healed and people being restored and, and people, their faith being renewed. And it did not say that the spirit that they were filled with uh, was, was joyful of all these things. It says they were filled with anger, annoyance, and jealousy. So why would a religious group, they claim to be uh, lovers of God, how could they want to send these men or these apostles to prison? And, and why would they have uh, this kind of a desire? Throw them in jail. Let's just put them to the side. Well, the Bible tells us why. They were filled, but they weren't filled with the right thing. They were filled with anger. They were filled with annoyance. They were filled with jealousy. Maybe they were filled with confusion. But this is what the Bible tells us, says indignation. So that's what these three things tend to lead to. In verse 17. So the, now the question is, why did they have that in them? Why did they have anger? Why did they have annoyance? Why did they have jealousy? They proclaimed to be God's revered leaders. God speaks to them. That's what they claimed to be, um, the righteous people of God living in their day. And yet here they are, and they want to imprison some radical believers who are moving in faith under the power of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because the Sadducees weren't seeing these miracles. They couldn't, they weren't laying hands on people and seeing people be healed. They did not see signs and wonders happening. Um, uh, but this newly formed church of all these different people, many who have not ever been to uh, a, some kind of a traditional biblical training like the Sadducees would have had, but they're seeing all this come forth out of the most unlikely group of believers in their day. This is different for them to see and different from the uh, their, their perspective and their, their thoughts and their actions and their emotions being filled with this indignation was different from the unbelievers in the society. I want you to think about this. We're talking about two different groups of people here that are watching God move through people that trusted him. Now you got one group that are just unbelievers. And as we said before, they're like, I respect them but I don't think I really want to be a part of them right now. This is too real. And now you've got a group of religious leaders who say, let's imprison them. Now that's different because um, this it's one thing to say that we don't understand the move of God. When we see, we notice that God is doing something. We see some things happening. We know some miracles are taking place. And it's one thing to say, you know, I don't understand that, but I know it's real. That's what you had the unbelievers in the society saying of the day. But it's another thing to say that that's not God because it doesn't fit our criteria. So we dismiss that and we know that it's not true. Now that is very dangerous. And, you know, they did that to Jesus. Remember when Jesus went around healing people and they said he's of the devil and Jesus, he had to tell them, hey, how can a house divided against itself stand? If I was of the devil and I'm casting devils out, then how does that work? Now, he was trying to tell them who he was, and the proof was there. You had people being healed. You had people, the demons were being cast out. You had people who uh dead being raised. I mean, how can one house divided against itself stand like that? Well, it's not going to, but they still tried to say it wasn't real. And Jesus, I remember uh, in the word, it says, before he went to the cross, he lamented over these people because he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He was talking about these Sadducees, the Pharisees, people who were supposed to know him and be able to hear from him. And yet they still did not with him in his midst. 
uh, him in their midst. And he was saying, how I lament for you and how I would have brought you under my wing and taken care of you. In other words, you know, these, these believers, these new form believers who are believing Jesus and they're allowing the Holy Spirit to use them and move through them. God could have done the same thing for this group of Sadducees and for the group of Pharisees, these, these learned religious men, if they had allowed him to, you know, we, but they simply for the by, by, uh, and far for the most part, they just wouldn't, and they wouldn't believe. And not only did they not want to believe, but they wanted to shut down what God was trying to do. Now, remember, if I had to title this message, it would be unstoppable God. There's one thing about God. And that is you can't stop his flow. I mean, you might do it in your life because he gives you the chance to accept or deny him, but you really can't stop the, the uncontrollable, unstoppable flow of God in the big picture of things. It'll never happen. And, you know, these people here, they wanted to shut down the apostles. And so uh, you might ask yourself, well, how do I know? Let's bring it into modern day for a second. And I go to a church, I see people praying. I see them praying for each other. I see things that I don't fully understand. I see people crying. I see people raising hands. I see people reacting differently. How do I know that's real? How you'll know, well, sometimes we feel the presence of God. If you're sensitive to God and you know him, you'll feel his presence and you'll know it's real. But a lot of times you're going to see the reaction or the result of those prayers, somewhere down the line, you're going to see them come to pass because God always confirms what he does. And that's what we see here. We see evidence. You see people in the word here being healed. You see people getting their prayers answered. And it wasn't because of Peter, James, John, and apostles, but it was because the Holy Ghost was allowed to move through these believers and through these apostles in the word, the preached word, the taught word, and in the prayer they prayed. Um, so that's how we know. You know, that's a strong indicator that we know somebody is being, uh, the Lord is using them and moving through them to see his will accomplished. Now, anytime God begins to enter prayers and move in miracles, signs, and wonders among his people, you can count on it, bank on it, that there's going to be criticism and to follow and doubt that tries to raise its head, usually right after or soon after, because, you know, it's very simple. Why? Why would we have criticism about a service where people are getting healed and prayers are being answered? Why would we have criticism over ministries that see these things happen, over prayer lines, over uh, people who are responding to the Holy Ghost in a certain way, whether it's speaking in tongues or going to an altar or whether it's raising hands or praying for one another, whether it's through tears or through laughing? Why would we have criticism like that? Have you ever noticed people don't criticize other people's emotions until it comes to church. I mean, you have people uh, that are grieving and, you know, sometimes people, I've seen people kind of get joyful and kind of laugh when they start talking about the past loved one. Nobody stops and says, hey, they, they must not have loved them at all. No, what people usually think is that everybody grieves in a different way. And sometimes we get happy when we think about memories and we laugh about them there at, uh, you know, at the funeral home when we're, when we are, when that person might be laid out in another room right next door. How can that happen? We all respond differently with our emotions. And why does that happen? Because God made us in the image of him. That means he has emotions. And so he built that within us. Now, um, you know, Again, the real test of things is 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 what's being done from the heart and what God has done in the meanwhile. But why do why do we want to be uh, so critical about a church service or about Christians who respond emotionally to an emotional God who gave us those? By the way, well, I can tell you why. You got to be very careful. You know, we are in this thing called the flesh. And the devil knows how to manipulate our flesh. And the devil does not want people to see the power of God at work in us today. He does not want people to recognize the power of God and the sovereignty of God. He does not want churches to be alive and flowing in the spirit of God. And he does not want believers to step out in faith and trust God. And, and if he can cause criticism and doubt to come through uh, other, other believers, uh, unbelievers or wherever he can get it to be implanted. That's what he'll do. The fire of God, the Holy Ghost of God is contagious. 
and he breathes life into uh, into us, our spiritual lives, into us and all that we do and think. He'll breathe life into us, and there's a power and a fire that fills us from within, and that's the Holy Spirit. So, yes, people tend to get emotional uh, in worship and in prayer sometimes in the presence of God because he's so real, and we see and we feel his presence, but it doesn't make him any less God, and it does not make him any less powerful, and that's what we're seeing here. Think about it for a second. Here are the scriptures that talks about, just a few minutes ago we read it, when Peter walked by, they were just wanting his shadow to fall on the sick as he's walking to the temple so they could be made well. Do you think, can you imagine laying there? Um, it makes me think about the man at the gate, beautiful, in former chapter that we've read here in Acts before. But can you imagine laying there and all of a sudden, you, maybe you've been laying there for weeks, days, months, or, or longer. The man at the gate, beautiful, had been there all, pretty much all his life begging at that gate. Can you imagine somebody walking by and they are full of the Spirit of God and the Holy Ghost power of God and they pray for you and all of a sudden, boom, you're healed by the power of God? Do you think that person might be emotional at that? Do you think they might would spring up? Well, the Bible told us that's what the man at the gate beautiful did. He leapt up and it said that he danced and he ran and he jumped and he went right up into the temple with Peter and John ready to worship God. It was lively. And you know, that's who we are as God's people. We've been saved. We've been redeemed. We don't have to go to hell. We don't have to be powerless in our lives. God's given us power through his word and through his spirit. Why wouldn't we be happy? And why wouldn't we rejoice? And why wouldn't we want to seek him out? And why wouldn't we want to throw our hands up in the air and give him praise for everything he's ever done for us? You know, I don't believe heaven is going to be a dull place. I don't believe it's going to be a place where people are sitting around on a seat somewhere and just silently thinking about the goodness of God and never opening their mouths. I believe that it's going to be a very uh, a very contagious type of place in that on one dimension of heaven, somebody's going to shout glory to God and it's going to be like a roll throughout heaven. Other people are going to be instantly, they're going to be thinking about the goodness of God and they're going to join that sporadic praise and it's going to flow all through the hills of heaven. I don't believe for one minute that it's going to be a quiet place, almost like a grave up there. Oh no. And why would we be that way here? You know, whenever I pray, I feel the unction of the Lord. He wells up in me, the Holy Spirit it does. And I can't be quiet sometimes. Sometimes he leads me that way. Sometimes he doesn't. But the point here was these religious leaders were in that mindset. They were anger uh, and they were angry. They were annoyed. They were jealous because they did not have the same spirit flowing through them that was flowing through that young, vibrant, believing church of new believers. Holy Ghost was flowing through them like this river you see flowing behind me here. I mean, he was flowing through them. A belly's full of that living water. It was coming out. They couldn't contain it. Oh, but these religious leaders, they had grown so cold and they had grown distant and they couldn't recognize the voice of God and they did not have that same flow. So the enemy tries to shut down the power of God by having uh, some of the apostles in this case in Acts 5 he wants them to be shut up. So he has these religious leaders who did not have the flow of the Lord, who didn't have the flow of the Holy Ghost working through them. Uh, he has them ar arrest the apostles, and they were put into a common prison, the Bible says here. Now, what does that mean? Well, a common prison, the word common kind of caught my eye. Common is like basic. And so it's like your basic prison where your uh, population of criminals would be. I mean, they, they didn't take any mercy on these men. They didn't do anything. They weren't guilty of a crime. They didn't kill anybody. They didn't steal. They weren't doing anything uh, that they weren't supposed to do. They weren't trying to develop some kind of an overthrow of the government or whatever. They were preaching the word of Jesus and letting the Holy Ghost use them to pray for others and seeing miracles happen, signs and wonders. And they were thrown into a prison built for criminals. They had done nothing wrong. But the reason they were there is because the devil wanted to shut down the word which they were giving to the people, and that is testifying of who Jesus is, 
testifying of his mercy and grace. They were teaching and preaching about the miracle, wonder, powerful, uh, wondrous work of the Lord Jesus Christ and through his blood, um, the, the, the power of healing and the power that we need in our lives. The enemy wanted to shut it down and the power of God, he wanted to shut down the power of God that was working through them. But again, very futile because the enemy's already been defeated. He can't shut anything down that the Lord won't allow him to. And, and this was futile as well. But that's what, the, that's what the devil wanted. And in the process, he wanted to discourage people from listening to the word of God. He wanted to discourage people from believing and reaching out past their own thoughts and their own rationality. Do you know there's a song, it's been out for some years now, but it's that one about, um, it's called Oceans. And it says, um, Spirit, lead me where my uh, faith is beyond borders, basically. I'm going to have to use kind of my own words here, but where my faith is is beyond borders and my feet walk out into the depths. You know, that's that's representative of what God wants us to do. He wants us to believe him for his word. But here, the devil's trying to shut it down and shut down the faith of people by having some people think only within their own limits and their own rationality, like these Sadducees. So let's go back to verse 19. And let's pick up from there. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with the elders of the children of, of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priests heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came in and told them saying, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence for they feared the people. See here again, they had that reverence for the power of God that they had witnessed because there's no other reason of how they, they could be outside of that prison overnight in the morning, next morning teaching in the temple. So they feared the people lest they should be stoned. They didn't want the people to turn on them. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Mm. That's stout. <laughs> Even as I read it, I'm thinking about the weight of that sentence. We ought to obey God rather than men. That ought to say a lot to all of us. Our number one heart's desire should be to please God and worry uh, at the bare least about what other people are going to think or say or critically want to uh, interject or do. But he said we ought to obey God rather than men the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. He didn't mince his words. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior and give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. You would think they would have maybe had understanding. When they heard this, you know, you, maybe you were thinking at first at the beginning of that sentence, when they heard this, they had a second thought. No, scripture here says they were even more mad. They were furious. They're not just annoyed anymore and jealous. Now they're furious and they're finding a way. They're going to try their best to find a way anyhow to kill these apostles and stop the word. Do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18 and 19? Jesus himself said, and I also say to you that you are Peter. Remember, this is when he'd asked Peter, who do you think I am? And Peter told him, you're the son of God. And he turns around and says, and I say to you, you're Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell or Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now listen to what he says. Jesus was telling him this, but I'm telling you, this is true for me and you today as well. As children of God, following the will of God, 
and flowing in his spirit, he tells him, he says, whatever you find on earth is bound, it will be bound in heaven. In other words, God is going to respond to that prayer. And whatever you loose on earth is going to be loosed in heaven. So he's going to respond to that prayer. Now, we don't want to pray uh, things that are not the will of God. But as long as we are flowing in the spirit of God and we are obedient to the Lord and his word, we can pray these kinds of prayers and God will answer. Miracles will come. Just this past week, I was sharing, shared you a minute ago. Um, I could tell you about one really quickly. We have some friends and fa uh, like family that live in Alabama. and We've been praying about their situation for a while. Long story short, um, things doors opened for them after that prayer Sunday. And they were things that were doors that opened that weren't the doors they were exactly looking for and things that we exactly were praying for. We were trying to pray for what we thought was right, but ultimately we were saying, God, let your will be done. And his way is so much better. He answered and he opened a door for them and that family in a way we that they didn't expect, we didn't expect. And it was truly a miracle, miraculous. And it's, it's going to change the face of, of how their family functions. And it's for the better. Um, it's a refreshing. They, they all felt so refreshed and felt so released from the burden they had had. And that is of God. And that is his power moving. Even when the devil tried to shut down these believers from teaching, preaching, and praying and obeying God here, he still reminded them, God did, that he was with them. Even though they were going through something, they were arrested, they were thrown into jail. The devil wanted to discourage them and make them feel like that's the end of the road or that they're going to have to try to figure out another way or back down or, or somehow be uh, pushed into a corner. But God was letting them know he's with them and his power is still very real even when they're in that prison and he sent an angel as as a, as the uh answer and, and a symbol of all that to them the angel was real he sent that angel to represent that his power is still real and he still knows where they are and the angel came during the night and he when those prison doors um opened and he gave them instructions of what to do go and speak to the people in the temple and and he made sure god made sure that they went and were able to do what he had, he had instructed them to do. The message from God was simple. Keep doing, in essence, this was the message. Keep doing what you're doing in your obedience to me. And remember, there's no power that can restrain and defeat you when you're flowing in my power and in my spirit. This is what he was letting them know that night. This is what we need to be aware of today in 2024, that there is no power that can restrain and hold back a child of God that is flowing in his power, in his word, and in his spirit. There is nothing that will overcome you or overtake you. The Bible tells us there's no temptation that can overtake you or overcome you, but such as is common to man, for God is faithful. The Bible tells us he's faithful to deliver. He's faithful to give us the power to overcome. He's faithful to give us favor when we need it. And his spirit does the work through us and in us. But we have to remember, even when we are in those uh, moments, when we feel like we the devil's trying to restrain us and it calls us to enter a time when, when maybe, you know, for a few hours when they first went into that prison, they might have been a little bit, I don't, I don't know if they were confused, but they might have just not known what God's plan was. They're in a place where they're like, well, I'm not sure what God's plan is here. Uh, but I think some somewhere, somehow, they held their faith because the angel did come and God did bless and God did touch. And that's what we've got to remember. When we enter times of uncertainty in our lives, we don't need to, to sit back and dwell on the dark prison cell it seems like we're in and the restrictive things that seem like have overcome us spiritually or mentally or, or physically or whatever we need to remember we serve a god who is more than enough and his power his spirit still flows and we need to embrace that and the obedience to our relationship and our obedience to him and our relationship with with the lord and we need to allow him to show us the things we need to see and speak the things he needs to speak so that we can 
do what he has empowered us to do. So when they were picked up and questioned the next morning, because obviously the guards came and they were going to pull them out of jail. They're not there. Uh, they're teaching in the courtyard over there again and in the temple. So when they come to get them and tried to bring them before the religious council, uh, you'll notice that they did hunt, they did find them in the temple, and then they did bring them to the council. But you'll also notice that the apostles' testimony and message did not change. When they got before the council, they didn't start backpedaling. They didn't start trying to make things politically sound correct. They still had the same message. You know, he outright said, this is the Lord Jesus himself whom y'all murdered by nailing him on the tree. I mean, he didn't back up one ounce and he still had the same testimony. It didn't change and they were unashamed to tell these religious leaders who were supposed to be in tune with God about Jesus and his power. So whenever we encounter the presence of God and we see his hand moving, we may not always be able to explain what God is doing. When they were thrown into jail, they probably couldn't explain what God was doing for their good right in the moment. Maybe they just, uh, they, they might have had to just do a lot of praying on that, but they kept their testimony and their faith. And we must do the same. We must keep our testimony. We must keep our faith and respect the fact that God is God. And it doesn't matter uh, what's going on or what season or what, what circumstance. He's still God. He's still in control. His power is still real. And the spirit of God still moves. And that's what they were doing. They were holding their testimony. We need to let people know about the power of God. We've got to stand unashamed and uncompromised before the doubters and those uh, that want to be critical about who we are as children of God and declare who Jesus is anyway and declare his powerful works to those around us. There'll be people, you'll find them. They'll say miracles don't happen today. That was that was for back then. We're in 2024. You got people who will tell you that the Holy Spirit is not supposed to move in a church uh, like we experience uh, because that was back in the day. Speaking in tongues was for the apostles back in the day. You know, you hear a lot of people that will bring criticism about the move of God. And I'm telling you that we know it's real. We know the Holy Spirit is real. His word is real. And all of these are backed up by the word of God. And we must stand unashamed and must stand unshaken with the testimony of the word of God living in us, breathing through us and through our words to other people. We know the power of God is real. I know he's a healer. I know he's a provider. I know he's a restorer. And I won't back down on that testimony that I have personally and from the word of God. And as the church of God, as the people of God, we must always stand on the truth of his word. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He didn't say I had to understand everything he ever did and, and understand his method or reason behind it. He just said, I need to have faith and believe him for who he is. And that was Jesus's basic message as well. When he was on earth and talking to people and preaching and teaching to them the word of God, he wanted them to believe in who he was and is and in his word. He didn't say, I need you to rationalize it, make it make, it make sense uh, and, and understand everything I ever do and ever understand everything I ever um, uh, plan to do. But he said, you got to believe. And that's where we are. We got to believe we're in a world that wants to, you know, even in our church world, so to speak, in the, in the church world of things, you got churches wanting to criticize other churches. You got churches wanting to criticize other believers. If they are truly believing and standing on the word of God, and they are truly sold out to God and his word. We have zero business trying to criticize or break them apart. You know, we may not understand how God is using them or working through them, but when we know God is and we see the fruit of that, then we must leave it to God and not judge. Amen. Let's go to verse 34. and We're going to finish this out. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. It's just to get real, in other words. So he wanted the apostles not to be there when he spoke. And he said to them, men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. Now he's speaking with wisdom here, and he is a Sadducee himself, and he's telling them, take a pause, boys. 
Well, let's don't be hasty here. He said, for some time ago, Theotis rose up, claiming to be somebody. A, man, a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered, and it came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up. And in the days of the census, and he rose up and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan is the work of men, it will come to nothing. Okay, right there we know. If somebody's doing something in their own power, if they're trying to raise up people just unto them and, and kind of uh, boast themselves up, if they're all about themselves, if they're all trying to do this in their own fleshly power, it says it's going to come to nothing. And that's often very true. He's given examples here of how that was true in their day. And you know, and I know there are people who have done this in our current times who also wind up falling because they've tried to do things in their own power and in their own selves. But look at verse 39. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it. It lest you even be found to fight against God. If it's God's plan and God's power using uh, these people, if it's God's power flowing through them, and this is the reason why we're seeing people healed and restored and so forth, you're fighting against God when you come against how that method or however God chose to do that. You know, the apostles were walking to the temple, again, making reference to what we read tonight. And a lot of people said, we, you know, they put their sick just in the way so that maybe the shadow of these would fall on them, not because of who these men are, but because they saw the real power of God being demonstrated in these people. And they needed a touch from God. And they wanted they wanted healing and deliverance for their loved ones. So they would put them there. And, and you know, some people did stand back. The Sadducees here stood back and criticized that. They criticized the method God had used to heal these people. It wasn't that their shadow was great. It wasn't that the people were great. It's that the God in them is so awesome and so mighty, and the Spirit of God was flowing, mighty Spirit of God, flowing through these believers, and that's what touched and healed the other people. But yet you had people wanting to criticize how God was moving. Listen to what Gamaliel is saying. He's saying, listen, if it's of God, you can't overthrow it anyway. Nothing you can do can stop it. And he says, and if you're not careful, you'll be found to fight against God. I don't want to be in a fight against God. That's an automatic, automatic loss. Um, you know, he is God and he's over everything. And you have consequences for that. And he was warning them of this. And so verse 40 says they agreed with him. Somebody got some sense uh, and they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles, they beat them. They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. So they did still reprimand them. They still said, do not preach or teach in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council. Now listen to how they departed. These apostles didn't leave murmuring and complaining. They didn't leave with hard feelings against these, these leaders. They didn't leave with trying to bring criticism against the side that that maybe had been seen as being the wrong side here, but they left rejoicing, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his, which is Jesus's name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So when they left there, even after all of the criticism that they had to listen to, even after all of this that they, they had gone through, you know, this, all of the beating and all of this, um, that it says that they went away just praising God, thanking him that they could even be counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ and that they didn't stop doing what the Lord had told them to do. It was a move of God. It couldn't be overthrown, just like Gamaliel was telling them. And they, we see them pressing on. So even though they experienced difficulty and unpleasantness, um, they left shouting, they left rejoicing, 
And the very last verse tells us again, they didn't slow down. Their testimony did not change. They didn't neglect going to preach and teach. They didn't neglect going for prayer and praying for the sick anymore, uh, any more than they would have before. They were still on fire and following the presence of God. They were obeying him. The spirit of God was still using them. Sometimes the enemy will use people like we see here to try and criticize God's people and their faith. And when people don't understand something, that opens a door for that sometimes. Um, and then sometimes they, they question things or they criticize it. And the enemy tries to use those things to kill and disrupt it. Remember, we talked about that earlier too. But God always makes a way for his children. And when we put our trust in him, and when we come to a place in our relationship with him, that we can say, I praise you anyway, Lord. I praise you for what you've done. I give you glory for all you've given. It could have been worse, Lord, but you saw to us and you brought us through and you can praise him. Even in the trying times, he will strengthen his children and allow us to have that strength and to keep pressing forward. His spirit will move in us and stir us to keep on going and to be uplifted. He will strengthen his children and he will continue to anoint them for the work he's called them to do. Hallelujah. Do you remember that old song? It was an older song I used to hear much, a lot more when I was younger, but it said, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away. Well, as God's children, we got to be mindful in these end times that even though there might be criticism around us and pressure around us from unbelievers, sometimes even through uh, other people we think are believers, but the enemy is using them to bring out these types of emotions, this, this anger, jealousy, this whatever. You know, the enemy will use whatever he can to discourage God's people and to, to cause us to be distracted. But we must remember in these days what we have in us, the word of God, who we have in us, the spirit of God, and who we have on our side, God Almighty himself and his son, Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus covering us. This the world did not give to us, and this the enemy did not give to us, but God gave. He gave his son. His son gave his life and his blood for us, and he gave us his spirit, and he gives us his word, and nothing, not anything, can take them away from us. Amen. You might set it down. Somebody else might set it down and walk away from it, but can anything, no one, take it from us? God gave it, and he has the final word. That's why I love calling this study tonight, Unstoppable God, just like the river behind me in the picture. You know, you can't stop that river unless you you know, really, you can't stop a river. It finds a way. You ever seen how people in uh, in man-made rivers or, or bodies of water, they try to, even in, in regular natural rivers, they'll try to dam it up or try to uh, uh, try to keep that water from flowing. But let me just tell you, that water is still going to flow. It's going to, it's going to go in somewhere. It's going to, it's going to cause movement somewhere. Um, and, and, and really it's, it's amazing to me how water does that. It might see, it might soak into the ground of where it's at and pop up somewhere else in a hidden spring, you know, that's been known to do that. Water has. Well, in our bellies, we have a flow. We have fresh flow and anointing of this spiritual water, the Holy Ghost. In our bellies shall flow rivers of living water. Our God is an unstoppable God, and he is willing to do what he said he'll do and he'll always bring us through. God is so amazing, and he wants to show himself real, not just into the church, not just in my heart and life and yours, even though he does want us to still see him as real and be encouraged to the realness of his movements and of his works. But he wants unbelievers to see the realness of who he is in you and me and in the church and in our testimonies they can hear and see in our lives. They can hear and see what a mighty God we have. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I praise you, God. 
for you are unstoppable and you're real, God, and your flow, the flow of your spirit is real. And Lord, I pray that people would be, Lord, that, that your children, believers, God, would be more open to the realness and the presence of who you are. God, you know, we think we understand certain things about you, but you're limitless, God. You don't have boundaries, but you are mighty and you are amazing. And I pray, God, that you would help us to see that. And like that song references, God, that we'll take steps of greater faith. Father, allowing your spirit to flow in us and to flow out of us, that we would be obedient. And Lord, that we would worship you and give you praise and always stand firm and steadfast on the testimony we have based on your word. God, bless your people. Touch them with the word tonight, each and every one that has heard it. And God, I pray your blessings and your touch and that your will be done over every single family and heart in the name of Jesus. And the church said, excuse me, amen. I preached a little bit here. I felt the power. And so I got to take a quick sip of water. So we pray, I pray that you're touched by the word tonight. And I pray that you'll join us in the next few nights. Monday night, we always have prayer meeting online at six. Tuesday night, there's a youth word. Wednesday night, there's preacher with the Bible study. And these are opportunities to be fed. They shouldn't be our only chance and only time to come to the table of God. Prayerfully, you do that as well on your own in your private times. But these are times also to hear the voice of God speaking to his children. I pray that you'll join us at these times. We love you so much. We pray for you. We do believe. We believe God's word for you. We know that he is more than enough and more than able to meet whatever needs you have whatever needs your family has. And I'm just looking forward to hearing about more of God's moving, more of his miracles, more of his wonders in your life. Testify to the goodness of God. Let people know what he's doing for you. And I know you're going to be blessed. God bless you. We love you. Be blessed this week.